Hi, welcome to another session of the Potter's Roundtable, coming to you in 3D from Washington Street Studios. I'm Phil Bernberg. Today we'll be discussing defects in fired clay, different kinds of defects and their causes. Welcome to the Potter's Roundtable, a monthly podcast where we share our passion for the ceramic arts and a collection of topics specific to potters. Remember to subscribe so you don't miss a single episode. Enjoy the show. Last time we talked about kiln problem, performance problems in electric gas and wood kilns. Today we're going to be discussing defects in fired clay, or to put it another way, clay body defects. But basically, as, we'll, as you'll see, most of the defects that we'll be talking about don't really show up until the clay is fired. Okay, well, pottery defects in general are often difficult to diagnose and solve because for one thing, they can have more than one contributing cause. There, a lot of times, there isn't one contributing, only one cause, and they also may not show up until the last firing, even though the the actual the actual defect may occur much earlier in the processing. Um, for clay defects, the possible causes can be related to the clay body itself and the, the formulation. They can be tied back to the forming or the processing. That means the shaping and the drying stages. Or, or either one or both of the firings, the bisque firing and the glazed firing. So let's talk about some of the more common glazed, common clay defects. What, what do they look like? When do they show up? And what are their causes? Okay, let's talk about cracks first, since that seems to be one of the problems that people run across most often. And one thing to keep in mind is the fact that with cracks in particular, um, as you learn more about them, the shape of the crack and the location of the crack can tell you a lot about the cause. It's not just a crack is a crack is a crack. There's a lot of information just, just that you can gain from just where they are in the shape. So first type is just fairly common as a rim crack. That is just a crack on an open type form, such as a bowl that extends down from the rim. And this can actually be, be occur in a whole lot of the different stages. It could come from the shaping and the handling. For instance, if the clay is getting stiff and you bump the clay and you distort the rim and then you push it back to its original round shape, that's enough in some cases, if the clay is stiff enough, to start a crack. You may not see it, but it's enough to start it. Um, it can also occur during, during drying if the drying is non-uniform. If one side of this form, or let's say it's called it a bowl, one side of the bowl dries faster and it wants to shrink and bend more, at the hinge point where the clay is, is drying more versus less, again, you could also start a crack. It can also, this can, cracks can also form in the bisque firing. We talked about this before, that even though there's not much shrinking going on in the bisque firing, depending on how you stack the pots, you can actually cause cracking. And if you stack, if you, if you do what's called a hanging nest, if you nest pots like that, even though there isn't much shrinking going on, this, this top pot is always sinking down into the lower pot. And so if the lower pot wants to shrink, even maybe a half a percent, it's always restrained by the upper pot. So it's very possible to develop a rim crack in this lower pot because it can't shrink. It's being restrained by the upper pot. This is why you would never, you would never want to load them like that. Like this would be OK, because then the lower pot isn't restrained. But that's restraining the lower pot. So that, that's another source of rim cracks. And finally, also just non-uniform heating during the glaze firing. If especially if it's rapid heating in the, in the, during the glaze firing, or the high temperature firing, and one side of the pot is getting heated faster than another, well, as you're aware that during the firing process, the clay shrinks. So if one side of the clay is shrinking faster than another side, between those two areas where it's shrinking fast and not shrinking fast, again, you can get stresses built up and you can develop a crack. Okay, another, so rim cracks, multiple causes. So another kind of crack that's fairly common is what I call circumferential cracks near the foot ring. And basically what this means is this is a crack that's somehow associated with the foot ring. So if I have a pot that looks like this, and this is the foot ring, I might get a crack that goes like this, and it might go all the way around, or it might be in several sections, but it's just above the foot ring. And the key here is it's in, the port, it's in the area of the pot where a lot of clay was trimmed away. And this is basically due to non-uniform drying. This is caused by the fact that when this, when this bowl was being dried, the upper part was drying, and the lower part was still fairly soft. This is before the trimming. 
Then when the bowl was inverted so that the, the foot ring could be trimmed, the rim had already gotten fairly stiff. And now, now at this point, now after the trimming, now this, this softer clay with the foot ring is located, now it starts to shrink further, but it can't because it's restrained by the rest of the bowl, which has already shrunk to a certain extent and dried. So where you have clay that's moving against clay that isn't moving, basically, that's the conditions for a crack. And the problem with this, this crack in particular, this really only shows, generally shows up after the glaze firing. Um, it's usually, there's like stress in the clay, and it may not be a, a, a visible crack. So even though this is caused during the drying, it's very common for it to only show up after the final glaze firing. Um, another crack would be, that's related to this same idea about drying, is an S crack in the bottom. Or S cracks only form, if you look down at the, bo at the bottom, let's say of a thrown piece, the S crack only forms um, in the bottom when the piece is thrown on the wheel because of the drag that's created. If this had been a, a rolled out slab and I, had, uh, and I dried it under the same conditions, I'd tend to get a straight crack rather than an S crack. But again, this is a drying and shrinkage problem. The rest of the pot and, the, and the, the circumference of the pot dried first. And then when the bottom wanted to dry and shrink, it wanted to contract, but it was restrained by the ring. Well, it's not going to stop it from, from shrinking, so all it can do is tear itself apart. So again, so the, the S-crack is, it's also, in addition to non-uniform drying, the S-crack can also, or the, the crack in the bottom, can also be related to poor compression of the bottom. You're probably already all familiar with the fact that when you're throwing a form on the, on the wheel, one of the steps you want to take is to make sure you compress the clay in the bottom. This goes back to the orientation of the clay particles that we talked about. And if, if the clay is not compressed, the orientation is very different than the rest of the pot, which just exaggerates the differences in drying. Um, another location for cracks would be at joints. This would be where there are either appendages added to a pot, let's say a handle put on a mug, for example, or, or hand-built forms where maybe you have, slab, you have slab construction and you're assembling slabs. So you might have a corner in a hand-built piece that looks something like this. And this is, this is where two slabs came together. This could be due, to some extent, it could be due to orientation differences in the clay. Depending on how the, the clay was, was, was formed, if I have a, a drastic difference in the orientation of the clay particles at the joint, then the shrinkage is going to be different. And therefore, that can initiate a crack, which can show up during the drying, or it may not even show up until the final firing, when the, again, when there's additional shrinkage. It could also be related just to overly rapid drying. The fact that if the, if the drying is slower, even these differences in orientation and the differences in the shrinkage can be accommodated a little more easily if, you, if the drying is more slowly and the forces and the tension that develops can sort of be accommodated. But if it's rapid, it, it doesn't have, the, the clay doesn't have time basically to adjust to the, to the differences. Um, another, kind of, another kind of crack um, that can happen. It's just basically isolated cracks in a piece. You might, have a, you might just have a bowl form, for example, and you might see just a little crack that looks like that. And it doesn't, it's not an, and this could be anywhere in the pot, and it's not particularly connected to any other, any other features. One of the main things that can cause these are inclusions, and that is foreign particles of something that's in the clay. It could be something that doesn't shrink when the clay shrinks, like a large grain of quartz or some other mineral, and the clay tries to shrink around it, and it can't because it's sort of blocking the shrinkage. Or it could be, um, it could be for instance, a lime particle. If there's lime, if there's either a lime or limestone or, or a plaster Paris particle, that can swell actually and cause the cracking. Um, and finally, or well, not finally, I've got a couple more here because we never run out of opportunities for cracking. Um, another kind of cracking is where you have a whole lot of random curved, usually connected cracks. This is also known as dunting. And this is where I might have a pot that looks like this. And the whole pot, basically, is covered with, with random cracks. They might be, they also, depending on how the pot was formed, they might be more or less oriented. But they're all connected. And essentially, the whole pot shatters. And the cause of this, the, the ultimate cause of this, in general, is is a lot of cristobalite formation. Let's talk about that a little bit, what that actually is. We talked about this before, the fact that silica 
can exist in several different crystalline forms, which also have mineral names. And one of them is quartz. And quartz is the form of silica that occurs as an impurity in a lot of raw materials and especially in the clay. Um, and it's present in just about every clay body there is. But there's another form of silica called cristobalite. That, that only forms at high temperatures. And so if I take quartz and I heat it up high enough, and there have to be certain other conditions to that, that occur, but the quartz can actually change to cristobalite. And the problem is that when the, when the pot is fired, and if some of the quartz or the silica in the, in the, in the clay body has changed to cristobalite, now when the clay body is cooling back down at around 439 degrees, roughly, the cristobalite changes from one form of cristobalite to another, changes from what's called the high form to the low form. And when it does that, there's an instantaneous shrinkage. And so the problem is that if, I have, if I've created a lot of cristobalite in a pot, and the, the clay is solid now and it's cooling down, when it cools down to around 439 degrees, all these little cristobalite particles in the, in the clay contract all at once. And if there's enough of them there, and they're, and they're throughout the pot, basically the pot can't take that. It's this sudden shrinkage, and it basically the pot just shatters. It can't stand that sudden, inst almost instantaneous shrinkage. And these, this, this condition is aggravated by the fact, by two things. Either a, a clay body that has a lot of very fine silica in it to begin with, and the finer the silica, the more easily it's converted to cristobalite. So if the clay body has a lot of fine silica in it, that's sort of setting the stage for this to happen. And also, if you, when you're doing the firing, if you stay at high temperature for a long period of time, then you're, you're allowing more time to make more cristobalite. This is a fairly common occurrence for, with wood firing, for example, where, you might, where people fire sometimes for several days at a time, and you're just sitting at high temperature making cristobalite. So it, it, it sets up the conditions for, for more, that are more likely for, for dunting to occur. We hope you're enjoying the show. Please take a moment to leave a five-star review on your podcast platform of choice. It really helps new listeners find the show. Don't forget to subscribe to receive updates as new episodes are released. And if you'd like to support the video and podcast production of the Potter's Roundtable, become a patron. Go to patreon.com and search for the Potter's Roundtable. Your support will help us achieve our goal of creating a digital library spanning the ceramic arts for use by educators and artists alike. Thank you for your support. Now let's get back to the show. Okay, um, another kind of cracked, crack, or crack formation, um, they're related and it, um, they're co it's called spalling or delamination. And basically what this means is, this is where layers of the clay separate into a crack. So if I look, if this is a pot wall, I might have, and if you might not, you might not even see this unless you break the pot in half, or what, what will happen is oftentimes this will make the pot weaker. And so if you bump it, all of a sudden it breaks more easily than you thought it should, and then you can see this condition. What happens is there'll be a crack, a, like a layer that forms inside the wall of the pot. This can be, there are several causes for this. One of them could be that, for instance, if you're hand building and you're rolling out slabs, people sometimes will, over, to make a larger slab, they'll overlap a couple of pieces of clay and roll them together and then squeeze it down until it's the right thickness and then cut pieces out of it. Well, if they haven't really joined those two slabs together, then there really isn't a good bond between those two overlapping layers. And that, that bond can just separate. When, the, when these two layers shrink with the firing, they shrink independently. This one shrinks and this one shrinks and they basically pull away from one another. The other thing that can happen is, um, is, a, is spalling, which can occur during, which can occur during the, typically during the bisque firing, and it's a kind of delamination. This is where I have, again, this is my clay, but what happens is there'll be a layer of clay that pops off the surface, and this is due to the, 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 the change of water to steam during the bisque firing, and what happens is when this clay has been drying, but at some depth below the surface, the clay hasn't gotten completely dry, so there's essentially a layer of water when that layer of water changes to steam very quickly, 
it blows, it blows the surface off. And because it's a layer, it tends to pop a whole sheet or a layer of clay off. And this, 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 this kind of failure where you get these layers coming off from the outside is called spalling. And it's very characteristic. When you see that, it's almost guaranteed that that was the result of a steam explosion during the bisque firing. OK, um, so that's it for cracks. Let's, let's talk about another, another defect. There are, there are so many wonderful opportunities for defects in pottery. Unlike you know, things like painting a sculpture, we, we really have a lot of these, these defect things cornered. Um, so another defect is just warping, where the pot basically changes shape spontaneously during the, usually only during the, or primarily during the glaze firing. Well, it could be due to just handling the, and this goes back to the, uh, the idea of clay having a memory. Let's say you throw a bowl and then you trim it. And in the process of throwing it or trimming it, um, you, you, you hit the rim a little bit accidentally. And so you, you, you knock it, and it's no longer perfectly circular. So you take your fingers and you sort of squeeze it back to being circular. That's enough in some cases. If it doesn't start a crack, that's enough to actually set up the conditions where when you push it back, it looks like it's round. But then when it gets fired, the, the clay memory, when, it, when the clay can move, the clay memory now brings it back to where it was. So it could have been the fact that you tried to correct the problem early on, and the clay remembers where it was, and it'll, it'll actually go back to the original position. It could also be caused by warping by non-uniform wall thickness. Again, thinking about a bowl, if one part of the bowl has a, a, a wall that's a lot thicker or thinner than another part, they're going to shrink at different rates. They're going to pull in toward the center at different rates. And therefore, it's very unlikely that the bowl is going to stay completely circular because one side is shrinking faster or to a greater extent than the other side. And finally, as I said, this is where we're talking about you know, multiple causes. It can also just simply happen for a perfectly uniform bowl in the, in the high firing. If one side is heated more quickly than another, if it doesn't cause a crack, which we talked about earlier, it can at least cause one side to shrink faster than another. And once one side shrinks and starts moving in before the other side, it's very hard. The other side will never completely catch up. That's the point. Because you really, when you're firing it, you want the whole piece to be shrinking and moving together at the same time. And if one side gets ahead, and then later the other side tries to shrink and join it, it is very unlikely that it will, be, it will stay perfectly symmetrical. Another, another fairly common defect is slumping. And basically, this, this could be due partially just to the clay body. The clay body might have a very narrow firing range, meaning that because of the fluxes that are used or the ingredients in the clay body, it simply cannot tolerate much temperature variation. And so you slightly exceed the temperature, the temperature range of that, of that clay body, and it, the clay body will slump. It will start to get, you know, melt and get a little too soft. Or it could be simply just due to plain overfiring. Maybe you have a perfectly good clay body, and the clay body is simply overfired. Um, as you're all aware, when clay bodies are fired to the high temperature, the stoneware temperatures, there's actually a little bit of melting that's going on in the clay body. This is, this is part of the process that we call vitrification. So there's actually a little bit of glass being formed. Well, if too much glass forms, then the body can't stand up and the piece will, will slump. OK, another, period, another defect is bloating. And this is where, basically, again, I'm looking, we're looking at, I like cross-sections, so we're looking at another cross-section here. So here's the wall of a pot, and I get, I get a, a bump that looks like that on the surface of the pot. And what happens is that underneath here, there are a whole lot of sort of voids or pockets. What happens, this, this, in a way, when you break this in half, it almost looks like the inside of a biscuit where dough rises. And that's, in fact, what happens. Bloating is caused by impurities in the clay which have not been, been eliminated before the high firing. And when the, when, the high firing, when the clay gets hot enough where it's starting to soften, if there are still impurities here that can give off gas, the gas is being cooked out of the impurities, the clay is getting soft, and the clay literally rises like dough. And in some cases, these, this, if, the, if the wall is thin, you might get just a bump on one side, or you might, it might expand and you get a bump that goes through on both sides. Usually, they don't break open. If it's, really, if, if it's severe bloating, these actually might crack open, or you might see some cracks on the top of it. Usually, they're just bumps. Um, so it could be the ultimate cause is impurities in the clay. Typically, sulfur and iron are two of the common things that can contribute to this. But it also is due partially to inadequate bisking. If you have some of these impurities, especially the sulfur in the clay body, 
um, what you'd like to do is clean the clay out during the bisque firing and get rid of those impurities. Cook the gases out before you do the glaze firing so that they're not being produced during the glaze firing. It can also, this bloating can also be contributed to, in a reduction firing, gas or wood, by too heavy early reduction. If, you, if, if, the, if the impurities are in the clay body and you're in very, early, very heavy reduction early in the firing, there isn't a chance for these impurities to get oxidized and reacted and driven out of the clay. They essentially stay trapped in the clay. And then when the clay gets up to high temperature again, the clay gets slightly soft. In some cases, the impurities actually help the softening. The clay in that one spot get even softer than the rest of the clay body. And then the clay, sw and then the clay body swells and bloats. Somewhat related to this is another defect, which really only happens in reduction, called black coring. And this is where, again, in the, in the cross section, and you may not see this unless you break the pot, although this is another defect that actually weakens the strength of the pot. So you might see it inadvertently where you, you, the pot seems to break more easily than you would have expected it, and then you get a chance to see it. Um, so what this basically means is there literally is a black zone in the center of, the, of the, the wall. And usually it gets paler as you go to the outside, but it's blackest in the center. And basically, this is usually either carbon and or iron impurities that are, in this, that, are in the, in this, that are trapped in the wall. This can also be due to inadequate bisking. If it's carbon that didn't get cleaned out during the bisque, now the outer portion of the wall maybe got cleaned out, but it remained in the center of the, of the wall. This also can be be caused by very, early, very heavy early reduction where you're producing soot. And before the clay gets dense, the soot can actually penetrate into the wall. And then if, you don't, if it doesn't get burned out, you essentially, it's like carbon trapping of a glaze, only this is carbon trapping by the clay body. And then the soot gets trapped in here. And again, the problem is when this, this, when this carbon is trapped, in, it actually weakens the structure of the clay. Okay, a couple more here, drop my eraser. A couple more here. Um, another, another defect are, are craters. And this is where, if again, if I look at the, uh, look at the cross section, I literally see, this is the wall of the pot, I literally see something that looks, from the top it might look like a little circular pit. And, but this is actually a pretty kind of a V crater. This is caused by this is called, this is lime popping. This is evidence of lime popping. And it's caused by either limestone or gypsum, which is plaster of Paris. This is one of the reasons why you don't want to get plaster of Paris contamination of your clay. Plaster. Both of those, what's happened here is that there's been a little particle of limestone or a little grain of limestone or plaster in the clay. And when you fired it, the limestone or the plaster was converted, it was changed to calcium oxide, changed form, chemical reaction, right? Back to our, uh, we were talking about the chemistry before. And then when it was, and then when you, when you unloaded the kiln and the moisture in the air penetrated the clay, because this is during the bisque, the moisture changed the calcium oxide to calcium hydroxide. And when it does that, it swells. And it swells with enough force that it actually blows a piece out of the clay. So very often when you see this, the, one of the clues also is you'll see a little white dot in the bottom of the crater, tiny little speck, and that's what caused it. That's what expanded and blew this out. Okay, so this is, this is the reason why you don't want to have plaster contamination. Um, it can cause cracks, but in most cases, if it's anything close to the surface, that, that expansion of that little particle is enough to literally pop that piece of clay, that, that sort of, it, it, sort of a cone-shaped piece, it blows out of the surface of the clay. Okay? Another defect is scumming. And this is basically the formation of a thin, sort of discolored film on the surface of the clay. It can show up during the drying stage. Um, sometimes you won't notice it, and it might only show up during the, the, after the bisque firing. This is caused by, by water-soluble impurities that are in the clay, salts or chemicals that are in the clay. The same, the same kind of chemicals that cause basically hard water formation. And if there's a lot of them in the clay, when the clay dries and the water migrates to the surface of the clay and then evaporates, if there are minerals or these elements, these materials dissolved in the water, they're carried up to the surface, but then they can't evaporate with the water, so they stay there. 
So as the water evaporates, it brings these materials up to the surface and creates this film or this layer of this, of this scum, it's called. It's basically hard water deposits on the surface of the clay. Um, it can change the color. If you're not, if you're not glazing the clay, then you can, you can, it's kind of an irregular sort of off color, which is unattractive. But also, if, even if you're glazing the piece, this can cause a loss of adhesion of the glaze or crawling. So, um, which we'll talk about next time when we talk about glaze defects. But this is another reason. So this can affect the glaze thing. And again, you may, if you don't notice it, you may, and you go ahead and glaze it, you might have a problem with the glaze. And it's really due to the, the impurities in the clay body that, ha that occurred when it dried. And finally, there's the, the, another, another thing you might notice is that when you finish firing the clay, let's say you're making functional work, and you want, the, you want the water absorption of the clay to be relatively low so that it, it, the, the clay body is not absorbing water. And you fire the clay, and you find out that the, water, the clay body still has a much higher water absorption than you'd like. Well, it could be due either to the fact that there was simply not enough flux in the clay body. It's basically, it's an error in the clay body formulation so that when it was fired at the appropriate temperature, there wasn't enough flux to cause enough vitrification for the clay body to get dense enough. Or it basically, the clay body is underfired, and if it had been fired long enough and hot enough, it might have gotten fully dense, but it didn't. OK, well, like we said with kiln performance problems, there are a lot of potential problems. But the message is, they're all solvable. You may not like the solution, but there is an answer. OK, well, we hope that this discussion has been useful. And we know that this was a lot of information in a short period of time. So if you'd like to hear it again, you can listen to our podcast version of this presentation. Just search for the Potter's Roundtable on your favorite podcast platform. Also, if you enjoyed the presentation, please like it and subscribe to our channel and pass it on with, to your friends and other potters. This helps our videos get found on YouTube. If you'd like to support our educational outreach efforts, such as these presentations, consider becoming a patron. Go to patreon.com and look for the Powders Roundtable. And finally, check out our website, www.hfclay.com. The next topic in the series will be glaze defects, everybody's favorite subject. Thank you for visiting with us today. The Powders Roundtable is brought to you by Washington Street Studios and our patrons. If you enjoy the show, please subscribe, give us a five-star review, and tell your friends. If you want to learn more about Washington Street Studios and shared studio memberships, please visit our website at www.hfclay.com. Thank you, and we'll see you again next time on the Potter's Roundtable.